Candidate for President Chris Christie in Trump DeSantis territory pre-debate. So I'm just gonna be myself. I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be forthright. Down on DeSantis, taking on Trump. Whether you believe what he did was criminal or not is much less important than the idea that the conduct is awful and beneath, in my view, the office of the president. Chris Christie on the issues in our one-on-one -on -one conversation. I don't know the single political party that would say we're against mental health. Behind the scenes and bipartisan. I think COVID really highlighted, you know, how prevalent mental health really is and also changed the conversation about what mental health looks like. Mental health crisis in the crosshairs. An open seat, a special election. Meet the candidates running to rep you in Tallahassee. Conks, characters, the history of paradise. They came to America looking for a better life. I love this picture though, this is the Admiral. This is Admiral, um, Admiral Halsey, nicknamed Bull Halsey, five-star fleet admiral during World War II. The Florida Keys Bicentennial. We've packed the house, the big news of the week, and a peek behind the scenes this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Three days from now, voters get to see their first side-by-side -side comparison of Republicans running for president, who won't be at the debate. Two of the three Florida candidates, the frontrunner, former president, facing four indictments, Donald Trump hinting at counter-programming for himself, and Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, who did not qualify for the debate, though Associated Press reports he faked them into reporting that he did. And who will be there? Well, for one, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, the conservative governor who ran a blue state. He stumped in South Florida's Trump DeSantis territory to a politically diverse audience on Friday. Governor Christie then sat down with us right after. So good to see you. And thank, thank you. you. Good to you, see you again. You, thank you. You are the first presidential candidate in this race to appear on This Week in South Florida. Well, and I'm, we're happy to, I'm happy to be there <laughs> and happy that I'm being interviewed by you. Oh, thank you. I love that. Okay, so as we sit here, news is breaking that there is this memo for Wednesday night's debate from the PAC supporting Ron DeSantis, uh, essentially saying defend Trump, attack, or hammer, I think is the word, Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, I want to get your take on that because you're number two in New Hampshire right now. You're the guy to beat in New Hampshire. What's your what's your take on on the memo, the strategy, and, and then throw in what's your strategy Wednesday night? Well, look, I mean, I think that it's kind of silly to be running against Donald Trump and your strategy is to defend him in his absence. It sounds to me like you're more interested in being his vice president or being in his cabinet. Or, or not making his his supporters angry. Well, look, you know, some of, his, his supporters. some of his supporters are going to be angry. But the bottom line is that you want to be the president of the United States. You need to go fight to be the president of the United States. He's the front runner, as you said, and it's, all the polls verify that. So that's who you have to go get. You have to beat him. And I don't understand Governor DeSantis's strategy overall in the race. I certainly don't understand that memo that they put out there and why they put it out there. And, uh, you know, I understand all the speculation about them trying to send messages to him because they're not allowed to talk to him. Um, but this is the kind of thing, if you can't run your campaign without process stories every week about your internal campaign machinations, how are you expected to run the White House? Um, you, your strategy on, well, you've been in debates. Mm -hmm. You are a blustery, say it like it is guy, at least that's your persona. It is. I think I've been watching you long enough to think that's pretty accurate. It is accurate. What is the strategy Wednesday? How, how do you blow up on that stage Wednesday? The strategy is, is listen to the questions, answer them directly, and if someone says something stupid, to go after them. I mean, th this is not hard. Well, what would you qualify as stupid? Well, I have to, I have to hear it to know, Glenna, but I think if someone says something that I think is wrong, that I think is bad for the party or bad for the country, I'll challenge them on it. Because that's what we're there for. Yeah. We're there to compare and contrast for the voter so they can make an informed decision. So I'm just gonna be myself. I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna be forthright, and I'm gonna listen and try to make sure that I answer the questions in a way that helps to inform the public. So in this in, in this new cycles, you've 
you've been asked and you've talked a lot about the other guys and fighting the other guys. I want to talk about you and your candidacy yep. to be president of the United States. And I want to talk a little bit locally because we are a local program and sure. we're in Miami. Yeah. And you've chosen on your first trip to Miami to do two uh, Cuban-American restaurants, one a big deal stop for Republican candidates where we're sitting right now. Um, and you really haven't in your stops on this day, this is Friday that we're speaking, you haven't really spoken about the Cuban issues, the Latin American issues, which is a very diverse voting yeah. population here. But that's a change of pace. You haven't mentioned socialism. You haven't really talked immigration or Fidel Castro. Is that by design? No, I, I talk to everybody the same way. I don't have a different speech when I come to Miami. But these are important voters for you. They are. And, and by the way, that's why they had an opportunity for an hour and a half today to ask me questions. And you know, not one of those questions came up. Let me be clear. Um, so in case any of your viewers are wondering, uh, I believe in a free and a liberated Cuba. And I think that the oppression that's happening to the people in Cuba and has been happening to the people of Cuba now for over 60 years is wrong. And that America should not do anything to encourage or condone it. And I think the moves that President Obama made years ago, which he thought were going to bring a more open and free Cuba, have failed. And I'm not going to play the same kind of game with the Cubans, especially when the Cuban government is playing footsie with the Russians. You know, not unrelated. I, I heard you speak on the campaign trail about the immigration issue, huge here, about defending the southern border, about, about coming up with an immigration policy that's both national security and a humane process for legal yep. uh, stay, which is kind of what Congress has been unable to do in my lifetime, yes, I think. Yes, mine too. Um, but I want to ask you something very specifically about what Governor Florida, Governor DeSantis has done, and, and the state has its own immigration policy, and one of those is a budget and a policy to take people from the border that, that I guess Florida deems to be here illegally. In, some, in most cases right now, they will, they're not. They're here legally. But take them, put them on planes or buses, and ship them to other jurisdictions, sanctuary states, mostly northeastern. And, and I wonder what you think of that and as sort of the bigger picture, do other states, especially in the north, especially blue states, which you are the governor, were the governor of, do those states have a responsibility as well to take in people awaiting the immigration process to spend money like that? What, what is that to you? Well, look, I think the first thing in that context is to say that many of the places where folks were sent to declared themselves to be sanctuary states and sanctuary cities. Now, they declared themselves that because they were thousand miles or more away from the border and thought there was going to be no cost to it. Now, all of a sudden, when folks are coming there to New York City, for instance, or Boston, or Philadelphia, or Washington, D.C. Or Trenton. Or Trenton, New Jersey. Look, um, and, and Governor Murphy, my successor, said, we're a sanctuary state as well. Well, there's a cost that comes along with offering that. If you offer it, people will come. And so if, there's, if they've declared themselves a sanctuary state, then they have to be ready to accept what the costs are for that. Can't be a costless promise, which is what it was before. Now, as to Governor DeSantis's actions, look, I don't think we should treat people as political pawns. And I think- Is that what you think Well, I think he, Yeah, I think he did. I think he, he shipped folks um, many of whom said they didn't know exactly where they were going or what they were going to find when they got there. I don't necessarily think that's right. And so, you know, my problem with it is that you need to be fair to everybody. Be honest and open with everybody. And if you're trying to make a political point, make your political point, but don't use human beings to make it. I, I'm offended by that from him, and I'm offended by it from folks in the Northeast who said, sanctuary city, but don't come. Well, sanctuary state, but don't come. Well, they've made their declaration. They now need to stand by their declaration. One of the other Florida issues that is a national issue as well and very much in, in play right now is Florida legislature passed the most restrictive abortion law in the state, now in the courts, uh, six weeks, and after that, illegal. Um, you are pro-life. I am, and I believe that every life is an individual gift from God. I think in this place we're in right now in this country, every state should make their own decision. And we're in the process of doing that. You mentioned the law here in Florida. 
The law in New Jersey is abortion up to nine months. The law in Oklahoma is no abortion at any time except to save the life of the mother. So you're going to have different states take different positions. I think a lot of people were surprised to see the Ohio referendum go the way it went about 10 days ago. Months ago, Kansas, a red state, going in a more progressive direction. So I think the Constitution was silent as to this issue. Therefore, that means it should revert to the states, and every state should make their own decision. I hope at the end of the process what we find is that there's been a consensus developed by all the states. And if there is a consensus developed, I have no problem with there being national policy that's consistent with that consensus. But right now, we should not impose any national policy on the states. Give them and their people the right to be heard on this issue. For 50 years, they haven't been heard and were prevented from doing so by the Supreme Court. Now they can be heard. Uh, another of the new Florida laws is permitless carry. Um, our governor has said he'd like to, and many of his lawmakers that are supporting said that they would like to make it all the way constitutional carry, open carry. Um, I want to get your, especially in a state that's had mass shootings, I mean the Parkland shooting is a, a, an issue that really resonates every time someone brings up guns. And so I want to get your take on permitless carry, open carry, you're a Second Amendment candidate. How, where is that careful balance between gun rights and gun safety? I think the way to, 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 there's no easy way to do that because we have a Second Amendment, which is not inferior to the other amendments. It's the equal of all the other amendments. And so we don't want to infringe upon it. But what we need to do is focus much more on the mental health issues that are troubling these people who use firearms in an indiscriminate way to kill innocent people, many of whom they don't even know. And so we need to make mental health treatment more available. We need to make sure that our states are paying attention to the signs that someone may be violent, may be acting out violently. We need to make sure we monitor what goes on on social media and that law enforcement does that to be able to intervene. We need to make sure we provide greater protection at schools. Priority for you? It is. And because I think that the American people are tired of seeing these mass killings, and most particularly when it pertains to children, yeah. to have these things happen at schools like happened here in Florida. Yeah. So I would work with the states to help them do it, provide funding to help them do it, uh, provide guidance on technology to help them do it, but I'm also not going to infringe upon people's Second Amendment right to possess and own a firearm. Uh, so. I think that's a common sense way to do it that respects both sides of the argument, and that's what I'm looking to do. Governor Christie, grateful for your time. Great Clana, to see you. Thank you. Great to be on your program. You'll be back, right? You bet. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. So Governor Christie would have no idea how he was teeing up our next segment, mental health, now a mainstream crisis that excludes no one. Two lawmakers who are figuring out how to help, both right here with us next. A documented rise in mental health emergencies is playing out in our community in some ways maybe more obvious than others. Our collective horror learning about the Stoneman Douglas High shooters behavioral issues, the shock of a respected police director's self-inflicted gunshot, the effects of isolation and loneliness during a pandemic. Some state lawmakers are working on bills to bolster that part of public health care that included fact-finding roundtables this week that you're looking at right here. We get an inside look today from two of the lawmakers at the forefront right here with us today. State Rep Hillary Cassell, Democrat from Dania Beach, repping parts of Broward County. State Rep Joel Rudman, Republican from Navarre, rep repping, repping parts of the panhandle. Mm -hmm. A lot of peas in there. Absolutely. Welcome. Your first time with us. So well, happy to have you. you. And you are quite the veteran of this week in South Florida. Um, you know what's really interesting about our discussion today is 
you, you all come to this with a lot in common. You're a family physician, you have very personal attachment to mental health, yet you could not be more different. You are different parts of the state, different parts of the aisle. So um, since you're visiting our community, <laughs> let, let me just ask you about that. I mean, is, is this a sign that we can see a lot of bipartisan work really does get done in Tallahassee and this might be one of those things? Absolutely, Glenn, 100%. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm all the way down here in South Florida is the fact that I'm here to give a message of hope, not just to people suffering from mental illness, but to all your viewers as well. Because if they're anything like me, they're probably sick and tired of hearing about partisan politics. They didn't send Rep Cassell and I there to fight, they sent us there to solve problems. And that's exactly what we were trying to do this weekend. And you are part of these roundtables. And I know we talked, and, and we've known each other a little bit longer than today, um, but I was very surprised about what a personal attachment you have to this. Uh, mental health issue as a whole that you've been very upfront with. Yeah, you know, this conversation's personal for me. I was diagnosed with bipolar about 13 years ago. I was four years into my legal career, $160,000 in debt, and I saw and experienced firsthand what a lack of access to care can do with somebody in crisis. So tackling this issue, solving these problems so individuals don't experience the obstacles that I did is, is important to me on a personal level and as an elected official. So obstacles can be a great big umbrella term. So we're talking about obstacles to you know funding, healthcare, accessibility. Um, what, what are you finding in these in these roundtables, because I, you know, I'm just going to go on the record. The legislature in Florida has been passing mental health bills for a long time, including and just a quick shout out to Christine Hunchofsky, rep from Parkland, who is very much a part of the mental health world there. Uh, but what what did you learn that you can write up a bill with? So, Glenda, this was our fourth roundtable uh, across the state. We held them earlier in places like Destin, Daytona Beach, Orlando. So we've had four of these roundtables now, and it comes back always to three basic categories. There's always access to care. There's always issues with reimbursement. I mean, mental health is not profitable for our hospitals or for our providers. And then, of course, there's the issue with a workforce shortage that we're going to have to address as, as a legislative body. So you heard a lot of these things as you were doing roundtables from the professionals. Over and over. So what, you have anything, you have a couple of bills, I think, that are already written. Yeah, I do. Last year I, I filed two bills, one of them dealing directly with our workforce uh, shortage crisis that would provide incentives to those individuals that are currently getting that level of education, that not only would they get some reimbursement or a loan scholarship forgiveness, but it would encourage them and require them to go back and provide healthcare in those community-based programs rather than going into private practice where we see such shortage. So that, that's an interesting bill because that bill was, and maybe not the exact bill, but something very similar was filed in the last legislature that kind of died on the vine somewhere. I know that's not a technical term, died on the <laughs> vine somewhere. But do you remember that, right? I'm oh, not, absolutely. Why, why as, as a member of the party that's got the supermajority kind of dictating what gets through, why, why did that die? So I was amazed as well, Glenn. And when you look back at the number of bills we had in the healthcare silo, there's a lot of good bills there. Uh, Rep Cassell had one tied up. I actually had three good bills that were tied up until the last committee meeting. So I think it was just the sheer volume of, of bills that were filed. Also keep in mind the fact that both Rep Cassell and I were both freshmen. So when you join a legislative body, there's always a little bit of this feeling out. You know, does, does Dr. Rudman really know what he's talking about? You know, is, is, is this something that we need to investigate? And I think with Rep Cassell and myself, I, I can't speak for other people. I think there was this feeling out process in terms of do they know what they're talking about? And when you go back and look at the bills, uh, these aren't the only good bills that uh, died in committee. There were several others. There was a bill that would eliminate what was called step edit. So if you were on a psychiatric medication and your insurance tried to say, no, we want you on a cheaper medication, there was a bill that would have outlawed that process. That bill will also be coming back. There was another bill that would have helped patients reach their deductibles quicker in terms of buying uh, expensive medication. So all of these are bills that you will see again in some shape or form. So I guess the obvious question is, how are they going to get through now when you know there's going to be a whole session full of really important bills? Well, I think the fact that we are working together, so we are part of an informal consor consortium of about 12 freshmen. So this Many summer, of whom were at that round table, Exactly. Right? So we all saw the same thing. So during the summer, we've all gotten together and we've kind of prioritized, well, hey, Rep. Cassell's bill was an important bill. Let's not, let's not muddy the water. Let's not block the works. Let's, let's get this bill through. And the same with those other bills that I mentioned. So there's going to be more of a concerted effort 
to focus on these bills this year? You know, I, I have to think of I, anyone who knows your face from this show knows you're usually here talking about property insurance because you, your um, knowledge is broad and deep on property insurance. And Democrats had put forth a lot of amendments for property insurance that just kind of went away, mostly because they were from Democrats. Do you feel, and I, and I hope you will talk candidly with us, do you feel like this subject as well, mental health and, and those kind of bills that might be lost in the shuffle might have something to do with partisan politics? Maybe not right here, but elsewhere in Tallahassee. I think the obvious answer to that question is yes. The reality is when you're fighting the culture wars that were being fought um, last legislative session, specifically in the healthcare silo when it came to denying access to care for members of the LGBTQ community and attacks on a woman's right to make a decision about her own body, there's limited amount of time in a 60 day legislative session. And when those um, you know, silos, those committees are filled with those type of culture war bills, good bills like mine don't have the opportunity to see the light of day because there's only so many committee, committee opportunities to be heard and when they're filled with with a bill that takes the entire day the entire agenda a good bill like mine can't can't make its way through you know interesting that you bring up what a lot of people call culture wars because a lot of the components of those so-called culture wars might also be components of mental health bills that's something i want to talk about when we come right back for a quick break and stay tuned we'll be back We are back with state reps Hillary Gassell, D from Dania Beach and Broward, and R, <laughs> Paul <laughs> Rudman. Um, did I just call you Paul? Joel Rudman. Joel. You look like a Paul to me. It's okay. Joel Rudman, <laughs> Dr. Joel Rudman, who is from the Panhandle, visiting us both here to fact find and write legislation for mental health. Um, right before we went to break, it popped into my head what a big umbrella mental health is and the so-called culture wars that have sucked up all the oxygen in the news world uh, on a state level. You know, so it, within the mental health realm is transgender issues and LB, LGBTQ issues. And I wonder, as a conservative Republican, when it comes to providing accessibility and affordability to mental health, is that inclusive? Absolutely, 100%. And Glenn, we were talking earlier about why bills get to where they get and why some bills die on the vine. A lot of it is you have to have a concerted effort. You know, when I first ran for office, this is my first elected office, the hardest thing for me to do was to get to 51% of the vote. I mean, 51 is a big number. The House of Representatives, you have to get to 61. So I think before, you know, when we were talking about certain bills and why they make it and other bills don't really seem to have a lot of momentum behind them, this year you're going to see that concerted effort behind our group of 12. As long as other, you know, along with other legislators who weren't part of our consortium, but you're going to see a massive push to get these bills to 61 votes, to get them across the finish line, all aspects of mental health included. And, and do you think, do you foresee pushback on that? Because there's a, you know, there's some people come from so, a faith-based argument that's very hard to persuade otherwise. So I really don't think the topic of mental health itself is actually very partisan at all. I just think it needs... It, it, it needs a coalescence. People need to get together and build bridges, and that's exactly what we've been trying to do this summer. Like, for example, you're never gonna hear a politician go out on the street and say that they don't care about mental health, right? Oh, Everyone's gonna talk the talk. Especially now. Exactly, Especially but, now. but you've got two representatives here that plan on walking the walk, along with others. Okay, let's let's talk paying the, paying the price. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Florida, about a million people just lost Medicaid coverage recently. There is no Medicaid expansion. Um, I know listening to the roundtable discussion, you had talked about, you know, floating an idea of maybe, you know, paying for Medicaid, paying into it. Well, what is that problem, that hurdle looking like to get over? So that hurdle is the hurdle, you know, the, the elephant in the room, right? We know that Florida is one of 10 states left to expand Medicaid that's failed to expand Medicaid. 69% um, of Florida's children are on a Medicaid type program. We know that all 50% of all mental illnesses are fully developed by the age of 14. The next group that's impacted by uh, mental illness is 18 to 26. Those are individuals that likely fall into a, a gap coverage where they don't have insurance provided by their parents. 
parents. So one of the bills when we talked about legislation that I filed along with my Senate partner, Senator Berman, um, would look into whether or not we need to expand Medicaid for that. But that's something that needs to happen. The roundtables that we've all participated in, every single group that's participated, that is one of the top things that they say. Not only do we need to expand it, but we need to raise the rates for Medicaid reimbursement. They haven't been raised since 1990s. So we're asking our doctors to render services and care at 1990s prices. That, that's a component, I think, of the, the bigger picture. Absolutely. You, Glenn, if I you do that building. You it, do that exactly. building. Exactly. Right? And if I could piggyback on that, sure. so she's absolutely right. I mean, something's got to give here. We call it a health care crisis. But when you're in the middle of a crisis, all options have to be on the table. We're one of the last remaining 10 states that have yet to expand Medicaid. This option needs to be put on the table. And I can tell well, you. Why hasn't? What are, what are the reasons that Florida has not? I mean, that's federal money. Why, well, you, why well, not? You, well, you know, I can't speak for others. You know, they, they probably have their reasons. But what I can tell you is these are not handouts. These are not giveaways. They're helping working families. And they're helping places like Baptist Hospital back in Pensacola. Do you know Baptist Hospital, for every psychiatric inpatient admission they have, they lose $4,500 a day per admission. So they, these are not money-making propositions, but they're necessary. You have to put your money where your mouth is. You know, uh, one of the other ideas I heard on the roundtable was making mental health primary care. Exactly. You think that'll happen? Ten seconds. <laughs> I hope it happens. I think that's that's a key component um, that we can get away from those pre-authorizations that you can go see your primary care physician and that primary care physician can provide those services. We know that people have to take time off of work. If they have to go from doctor to doctor to doctor, that's complicated and there it, it you know prevents access to care. 100% um, mental health now almost mainstream. I hope um, now that we have a little bit about how the sausage is made, I hope you'll both be back. Uh, when those bills are filed, and we can talk about them in, in real time, and you'll bring your guitar and maybe play us a song. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate you. you both. Thank you. Up next, a South Florida seat in the state house is wide open, and this week we learned which candidates want to fill it. Be their colleague up there. Two of the three are right here, live next. The race is on. The lineup is set. Qualifying ended this week for the race to fill the House seat that became vacant when the governor appointed the incumbent as Miami-Dade County's clerk. District 118 is a sliver of South Miami-Dade, a swing district that has gone both Republican and Democrat, which makes this race really interesting for everybody. Two of the candidates of the three are together here for a very first District 118 combo conversation. Republican Mike Redondo, a personal injury attorney in his own firm and a first-time candidate. Democrat Johnny Farias, running again for the seat and electrician by trade, a business owner and former community councilman. Welcome to you both. Frank De La Paz is actually an independent candidate who we thought was going to be with us today, but is not, so maybe next time. Did I pronounce your name right? Yes, you did. Farias, not Farias. That was, that was a guess. So, so nice to meet you both and so nice to have you here. Um, since you were first in the race, I would like to start with you, and I want to give you just both a chance. It's not a debate per se yet, maybe closer to the December date it will be. Sure. Um, but right now I want to let our viewers get a chance to meet you and understand who you are. So who is Mike Redondo and why are you here? Well, thanks so much for having me first. And honestly, uh, I'm a person who was born and raised here in this district, uh, in HC 118, and someone that has always had an interest in politics, first time running for office, but you know, I was uh, the son of Cuban immigrants, like many down here in South Florida, and I got to experience firsthand what the results of hard work and opportunity can lead to. And so when this opportunity, when uh, Representative Arkeen was appointed to the clerk's office, it, uh, it was something immediately that, you know, a chance to come home and serve my district where I was born and raised was something that I definitely wanted to do. And so that's how I got here. You know what you're getting into here? I, I, at this point, <laughs> I like to think so, yes. You know what you're getting into, Johnny Farias. Who, y yes, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> well, Glenn, thank you for having us and all the viewers for tuning in. Um, I'm a regular guy. I'm a former Navy veteran. I'm thank a business you for your owner. Service. No problem. I'm a business owner. I'm a, fa I'm a working family man. And just like my neighbors, I'm just tired of the state legislature pounding us in order to make it harder for us to pay our bills and just live our life. I'm tired of it, and that's why I stepped in. 
You know, thank you for segueing into really what I want to get into. Um, I, I want to get your sense, both of you, of what you think the priorities of the district are. And, and not, you know, district voters are going to be voting for you, but everyone watching this program, the calculus of the math in the legislature is dependent on every single race, which makes this really interesting for everyone. Um, the Republican Party is the superpower majority, did the work, chose what worked to do, chose what passed. Um, we talked about the what everyone calls the culture wars sort sure. of sucking up all the oxygen in the room, but there was a lot of much more work that was done. Um, property insurance was a big focus, and yet what the Republican legislature did right now, uh, they think will stabilize the market, but there is really no immediate relief, and that is one thing our viewers say is top priority. I want your take on that and where we are right now and what your perspective is on how to make it more affordable. Sure, it's a great question. It's by far the biggest issue that we're hearing yeah. in the district. Um, people are, especially those who are living on fixed incomes and otherwise, I mean, if your insurance rates are going up 20, 30 percent every year, you reach a point where that's just not sustainable. Um, in my law firm, I mean, I deal with this directly. I think that, again, the legislature did a good job in terms of passing legislation that I think will have effects in the longer run. But there's certainly more work to be done. And I think insurance companies have to be held accountable to the extent that we're seeing problems where rates are continuing to go up and we're not having that. Uh, the, the policies are not being in terms of what the people are actually paying so for. So accountability is, is a sticking point for you. Absolutely. And, I, and I know um, just by virtue of your party, I'm going to guess that you have a vastly different idea of what should be done in, in legislating the property insurance. Oh, of course. I mean, first, there's a few things that we can do, but the two top that I want to bring to Tallahassee when I get there on December 6th is one, we're going to invest more money into the My Safe Florida House program because just this year it got halfway funded, but it hasn't been funded again since the last 17 years. And what this program does, it helps homeowners envelope their home which will bring the rates down. We actually talk about that program, not, not enough probably, but we, we have talked about that. But as far as the actual market for insurers, are you satisfied with what has been done? No, and that, uh, another thing, we need to make sure that insurance companies that give like car insurance, okay, if they want to do work in the state of Florida, they need to have some kind of portfolio or percentage of home insurance also. This, uh, this will open up the market and, and we'll bring more more people to be able to get insurance. Opening the market, how? Well, because now uh, insurance companies that didn't give it before, being that they only did car insurance, are going to have to have some kind of portfolio to carry home insurance. Oh, I see. So mandate that there's no yes. cherry picking. What do you think, um, Mike, what do you think is your priority for the district? What are the, the big issues for the district and for the state? And do they match? Sure. I think certainly the homeowner's insurance crisis is by far the biggest one. And I think that would certainly be something that's, you know, issue number one for us. Um, I think the other is education, as as people know, just not from their own children and you know their own experiences in school, but especially as we look to the future. I mean, the economy of Florida is dependent on us having highly educated people that can get good jobs here in the state. Uh, so I think continue to make sure that our students are getting a good education that prepares them for the jobs of tomorrow is another huge priority for us once we get to Tallahassee. And do you support the changes in education? I mean, there are a lot of changes in state education in a very short amount of time sure. from the vou universal vouchers that we have in the state now. Um, to all the guidelines on how to teach things like race and sex education. Are you supportive of those? I can tell you that you're right. There's been a ton of changes, yeah. but specifically when it comes to things like school choice and vouchers. I mean, I'm, I was a fortunate beneficiary myself. I was able to attend a magnet program at a public school, Coral Gable Senior High, that wasn't my home school, and it was essentially a form of school choice. So I mm -hmm. think having school choice in place is tremendously important. It gives parents that option. Um, so certainly when it comes to the voucher program, I think it's been a huge boon, and I think we'll see a lot of payoff from that down the road. Yeah, school choice comes in a lot of different forms. Absolutely. For sure. Johnny, what are your, um, what's your vision for the priorities, your priorities of the district and for the state, and, and do they match? Well, we have a little different priorities, but yeah, ed education is dear to my heart. I raised five adult children, and I have two grandkids that are, that are going through school. <laughs> okay, so I mean, yeah, my life experience is, is by far, but in my in, in District 118, we're not talking about what books our kids can read. We're talking about how we're going to feed our kids, because right now our inflation here in the state of Florida is at nine percent. State nationwide is four percent. Okay, that's what we need to we need to fix. So people need to feed the, feed the families. We need to make sure that people can keep their homes. 
Um, since I since I asked Mike, the the education changes the broad as a big broad question in a very short amount of time before mm. we hit the break. Are you supportive of the education changes so far that you've seen? No, I'm not. Um, I mean, it, the governor passed um, uh, a year ago or two years ago something about you know that parents should have the right to to for parents pay for the kids. A pa now, big parents' rights. Right, push. but yeah, but now he wants to tell you what they can do in school. Uh, no, so. I'm not supportive by what's going on right now. A very good, concise answer. As we head to a break for two minutes, we will be right back with more with the candidates. Stay tuned. We are back with Johnny Farias, Democrat, Mike Redondo, Republican, running for the open seat in District 118 Florida State House. December 5th is the election. The conversation is starting here. I love being first. Um, I want to really talk about, we mentioned the culture war type of legislation that headlined everything out of Tallahassee. You know, the state and the nation, the rhetoric is very heated. There is woke left indoctrination. There is right wing extremism. Those words we hear so often. Um, Mike, let me start with you. Do you do you buy into that kind of rhetoric as effective messaging? Where are your passions? Sure, I think that there's certainly a room and a big appetite in the district and really across the state for people to try and get problems solved. And I think very few people want anyone, a legislature of any party, to go up to Tallahassee and just yell. I think that there's a lot of room for us to come together on issues that will help South Floridians uh, and the rest of the people in the state and especially in the district from what I'm hearing. People don't want me to go to Tallahassee and just yell. They want us to work on real problems and come up with real solutions. So. I certainly think that there's room to compromise and negotiate on a lot of issues. Some issues certainly not. I think there's principled positions that we all have. But certainly I think by and large that the goal is to get things done, not just talk about stuff. Would you be open to saying on the record today that you will not buy into that kind of rhetoric? Yeah, I, I think my, look, I'm a first time candidate for office. I mean, my background has been uh, seeing both sides of issues my entire career. Um, I think where we can find common ground, we should. And absolutely, that's something I would do in Tallahassee. Johnny, do you, I want to get your take on it. Do you buy into that kind of rhetoric as, you know, it is effective messaging. We see it works. And, and would you would you take that step back? Or are you very passionate about it being an important part of campaigning? Well, no, I, I don't. And in, in this district, I can tell you, we, you know, we did an internal poll. And my constituents are more worried about the insurance and about the inflation that's going on. In fact, I'm glad you ran that up because I actually have a you letter. You brought notes. I bring a letter actually from a, from a neighbor. Okay, and these are the things that, that we're discussing in my district. And very, I'm just gonna highlight you, I'll read you the highlight part. That the clearinghouse identifies a private market company willing to offer you comparable coverage when it's an estimated renewal premium that is not more than 20% greater than your citizen's renewal premium the citizen's policy will not be renewed. I, we talk a lot about that for anyone who is not clued in on this. That's citizen, sh citizens insurance shedding their policies because they need to be able to afford it. And the cherry picking that goes on with the companies can yes. charge you 20% more in your premiums. Just wanted to make that really clear. And, um, and so the kitchen table issues. Yes. And so would you, would you go on record with us and say you will not participate in any of that really heated rhetoric? No, I will not because this is what's important. This is what I'm going up to Tallahassee to fight for, for the kitchen issue tables. So let's talk a little bit, before we run out of time, a little bit about the actual horse race. Because sure. we have we have a, a three-way race, I think. And Frank De La Paz, uh, the independent candidate, may or may not be very vocally or actively campaigning. We don't know. But you, you just filed a few weeks ago. Yes. Um, your campaign finance pages on the website are empty. <laughs> there's, there's no contributions, no expenditures yet. So mm -hmm. you haven't started. Is that true? No, we, we started. Oh, so give us a sense of... We don't need of, to um, report till the end of the Right, month. right, right. So give us yeah. a sense, since we can't see it publicly, What? who are your supporters and, and My how supporters that are neighbors, regular people. I have no lobbyists. I have no money from party. I got regular people that are supporting me because this district wants a regular person. It's not about whether you're a Democrat or you're Republican. It's about having somebody that has raised their children in, in, in the district. So let me ask you this, is the Democratic Party of Florida actively going to be supporting you? Have you coordinated with them at all? Yes, I have. Yeah, I have coordinated with them and yes, they are helping me. So the Republicans are definitely helping you. You actually filed a few months ago, so I can see your <laughs> first filings. You've yes. got about $71,000. 
um, contributed so far, and more than a third of that is from party and uh, political PACs. And, and so there are going to be people who will say to you, where are the regular people in your campaign? Sure, and I think they're obviously uh, dispersed within our contributors. I mean, we do have a broad base of support. I'm very fortunate to have had support from the state party and others, but to me it's, it's about, as we've talked about, sort of getting the job done. And uh, as someone who's not, you know, I've never been in office before, I'm not beholden to any groups or anything like that, but I'm always willing to talk to people, hear what the issues are, and I recognize that there will be times where I need to have some form of education from an expert in an industry, but at no point will we ever lose sight of our constituents, the people who are actually going to be voting to get us in. Would you ever see yourself in Tallahassee as a freshman legislator voting against what your party might want you to vote for? Certainly. If, if there's a situation where, uh, you know, there's, if there's an issue in, that's going to hurt my district and hurt my constituents, that somehow, you know, if there's, for some other part of the state or something might bring some benefit, I mean, obviously that's a conversation I would have with leadership, make sure that there, if there's some way to address it. But at the end of the day, if I have a bill that I think is bad for my district, I, I certainly wouldn't support it. And if you have a bill that is not good or bad, how, how would you go? I mean, if, if I didn't have a position one way or the other, I'd certainly want to work with leadership because the way this, even though I'm not a politician, the way I, I, I've learned that this all works <laughs> is you got to go along to get along sometimes. And certainly the priorities that I do have for the district, I want to make sure those get attention as well. Yeah, somehow when you file for office, you actually are a politician. Yes, that's true, <laughs> right, at this point. What, um, Johnny, what do you think? If you were sitting in that seat in the big state house and the vote came up and you knew how the Democratic leadership wanted you to vote and you felt otherwise, how would you handle that? Well, first I want to comment on something, okay, and you, had, you mentioned before, you know, where are the regular people that are donating? And I'm going to tell you, I mean, it, it's, it's public knowledge. When you go up there in the Republican Party, you got to file rank and suit. And I understand that because at 17, I joined the Navy, and I had to do the same thing. And in this case, any Republican goes up there, they got to do the same thing. So for you to tell me or say to the, to the viewers that you're going to get $40,000 and not file rank and suit, come on, it, it's, it's, not, it's not happening. Okay. Now me, I'm a regular guy. I'm 53 years old. I don't need to be told what to do. I am for the people. Johnny Farias, Mike Redondo, I really look forward to the actual debate that we're going to have for 118 when we get closer to that December date. And I sure do appreciate your time and you being with us for our very first 118 conversation. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Up next, the Conk Republic turns 200 and we're celebrating the Keys' history and its future. Writers, rogues, pirates, politicians, key lime pie, just some of the characters of the Florida Keys, Conk Republic marking a bicentennial. And to celebrate a Local 10 special tonight, our de facto Keys Bureau Chief, Janine Stanwood, has a preview. This mangrove line channel here in Key Largo, it's pretty magical. It leads us right out to Everglades National Park. On Sunday night, we take you to the Florida Keys in ways you might not have ever seen. They came to America looking for a better life. We explore the history of the people who first settled here and those throughout the years who have called this island chain home, like writers, early black leaders, even presidents and military brass who have said they feel more like themselves when they are here. I love this picture though. This is the Admiral. This is Admiral, um, Admiral Halsey, nicknamed Bull Halsey, five-star fleet admiral during World War II. And here he is in the Florida Keys wearing a a flower uh, shirt. shirt. <laughs> yes, it is. Hi, JJ, how are you? We chat with well, Hall of Fame coach Jimmy Johnson, keys. who fell in love with the Keys when he started diving here, and about how even with challenges like traffic and hurricanes... Hey, we deal with it. Because we love it. We do love it. And Keys history wouldn't exist without the offbeat, like the unofficial secession from the United States, characters like Fred the Tree, and mythology surrounding pirates and key lime pie. That's delicious. <laughs> it's a look back and a toast to the future. Cheers! Tonight at 7 o'clock, Florida Keys at 200 celebrating paradise right here on Local 10. So great to have you with us this hour. Have a beautiful Sunday and keep in touch.